Professor Greg Barton is one of Australia's foremost experts on foreign affairs, counterterrorism and international relations. He's also a regular on The Informer, and Professor Barton joins The Informer once again to discuss the recent extradition of accused Islamic terrorist Neil Prakash, also why Australia's nuclear subs are high priority for the US, and why has Russia actually denounced its oil price cap? Welcome, Greg. Great to be with you again. Thanks very much. Now, a lot's been happening this week in, in foreign affairs and international relations, so let's begin with alleged Islamic State terrorist and Australia's most dangerous man, Neil Prakash. Prakash is finally back in Australia, on Australian soil and in the hands of authorities, and he's facing six counts of terrorism, and he could spend the rest of his life in prison if he's found guilty. Now, it's been a long time coming, but now he's here. How did we finally manage to extradite him back to Australia, and what did it take to do it? Well, we don't know the full details of that story, but we can safely say well, we know it was a long time, a lot of hard work. Uh, it's been extra difficult because uh, other factors have come up along the way. Um, we changed our terrorism legislation in October 2014 to say that if you were in an area controlled by Islamic State in, in Raqqa City, the capital, uh, or in Nineveh province where Mosul was, uh, you would then have the, the, the onus on you to show that you weren't working with Islamic State. Um, and that puts us at a much stronger position for prosecutions than, than most of our, our fellow Western democracies. But getting Neil Prakash back was was difficult. I mean, it, we'll have to wait and see how it goes through court. But for the reasons I've outlined, um, that makes the prosecution more straightforward because he was clearly in Syria um, and, and clearly involved in many activities, including propaganda videos. So it's going to be hard to mount a defence that he wasn't uh, actively supporting Islamic State. But let's see how that plays out in court. But the reason it's difficult is because Back uh, in uh, 2018, we, we had um, Home Affairs Minister then, Peter Dutton, come out and say he was stripping uh, Prakash's citizenship. Uh, legal experts said, well, that's really tricky to do because somebody has to be a dual citizen. And the claim in Prakash's case was that he was also a dual citizen or had access to, to Fijian citizenship because his father was Fijian. Fijian governments came out and said, well, they didn't consult us. Um, we are never giving Prakash Fijian citizenship. He's not coming to Fiji. So that was uh, a, a dubious decision in, in law, um, but also the security agency at the time said, look, on balance, we should use this uh, stripping of citizenship, even when we legally can do it with dual nationals, we should use it sparingly because on balance, we're better off retaining our leverage on somebody who's offshore uh, if they're an Australian citizen. We can better surveil them, we can better get cooperation. Now, Australia has long had good cooperation with the Turkish authorities. Uh, but that has been more challenging since 2015, where there's been a series of political shifts in Turkey that have seen Erdogan consolidate power and launch a series of purges against all critics, including particularly senior military and police officers and members of the judiciary. So the the interlocutors, the counterparts uh, that the AFP would have been dealing with for years, most of the um, pro-Interpol, pro-NATO, pro-Western Alliance uh, security intelligence officers most of those guys have been purged. Some have had to flee uh, into exile. Others have been imprisoned on, on dubious charges. So AFP has had to work very hard with the Turks, uh, with people who are perhaps new to that role, recently promoted because of these purges. That would have been hard. Um, the Turks initially had said they didn't want to repatriate uh, Prakash. Ben Dutton said, OK, he's no longer Australian. And they said, well, in that case, you've got no business with him at all. Uh, he served his full six-year sentence uh, in a, he was charged in, in Turkey on belonging to a terrorist organization, Islamic State. Uh, so he was out and he could have been out and, and free to go into that greater Middle Eastern uh, jihadi underground. But the Turks uh, returned a favor and said, OK, we're going to keep him on immigration charges because he didn't see he had crossed illegally into Turkey and, and then allowed him to be repatriated to Australia. So somebody's done a, a lot of hard work and managed to rebuild relations in the most difficult circumstances. And the reason that they've done all of that is because they regard it really important to have Prakash back because they think he's more dangerous abroad than he is back in Australia. They also believe we can learn a lot from him as we as he has his day in court, many days in court, uh, about how uh, allegedly he was recruited and was involved in the recruitment of others. It's really important to understand that. It's not timely intelligence anymore, of course, many years have passed, but it's still important to hear that story. Most importantly, it's important that Prakash never again is involved in, in propaganda and recruitment, as he allegedly was. 
So there's a, a, a you know an iceberg with this story. There's more beneath the surface than there is above the surface. But what we can see tells us that this was an awfully big achievement. Um, coincidence or a tenuous link that we've just seen the Islamic um, brides repatriated to Australia uh, around the same time with no uh, seemingly no consequence for their actions. Well, there are sort of some clear links here, but it's a complex story. Um, the uh, the so-called Islamic State brides, and more importantly, perhaps their children, uh, born to them from jihadi uh, husbands uh, who are fighting with the Islamic State for the most part, as, as far as we know, um, they have to face justice. Uh, terrorism charges can take years and years to play out through court. So we you know, haven't seen the full story yet. They are in a position where they 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 are not at the, at liberty to go and do what they want. They uh, apparently entered into that um, agreement as they returned. So we may yet see prosecutions and sentencing if that's necessary. Uh, they claim, and this has to be tested, that uh, at least in some cases they went uh, either unwillingly or uh, in a, because of deceptive behaviour. And that, there's some plausibility in that. But anyway, justice will, will be served and be done. Um, once again, as with Prakash, it was safer to have them and their children back in Australia than to have them remaining in, in, in the Middle East uh, because for those who hadn't been radicalized or um, fully signed up to Islamic State, the brutal conditions in those uh, internally displaced persons camps in the north of Syria are such that some people are likely to be radicalized and likely to be a part of the next generation. I'm thinking particularly of the kids. Uh, at the same time, and here's a curious compounding factor, Turkey has been launching uh, military attacks across the border into Syria using the pretext that the Syrian Democratic Forces is basically the YPG which is the Syrian cousin of uh, the Turkish Workers' Party, the PKK. And the Turks claim that the, uh, the bomb attack in um, Istiklal Street in Istanbul was launched by the PKK with YPG um, support. None of that is clear. The evidence is not clear. It doesn't fit the pattern of previous PKK attacks. The PKK has engaged in terrorist methods. There's and a lot of lives have been lost at the hands of PKK terrorism. Um, it's a nasty story on, on all sides in terms of Turkish reprisals and, and war crimes. Uh, but when the PKK launched uh, a, a terrorist attacks, it's normally against uh, uniformed personnel, soldiers or police officers in a bus or a barracks. So that's not clear. But what is clear is that the SDF is in a desperate position. And they're saying to Western allies, America uh, primarily, but also Australia, that uh, uh, you know, we we helped defeat the Islamic State Caliphate. We've controlled this northern third of Syria that uh, was part of the Caliphate. We're holding thousands of people who were, we think, either fighters, terrorists with with Islamic State, or you know, family members where we don't quite know their involvement. We've been holding these people in camps. Uh, the camps are infiltrated by communications from Islamic State. Um, Islamic State has followed a typical pattern of breaking people out of prison where it can. Now, with a Turkish invasion, uh, we won't have the personnel to keep these camps safe, uh, and, and, and we may lose people out of these camps back to Islamic State. That's, a, I think, an understandable pitch by the SDF, but also very plausible. Um, so if we didn't bring people from those camps out, if we don't do with the remaining ones shortly, we may lose them to Islamic State. And uh, even if they, um, they, as they, as many of the women say, were, were not supporters of Islamic State when they saw the reality, uh, their children are likely to be radicalised and recruited. So it, it's actually in our natural security interest to get people back to Australia where we can uh, keep them safe and stop them being an influence, uh, learn what's happened. Some of them will be rehabilitated, particularly kids. Uh, it's not a zero-sum game where we're tough on them and it makes us safer. It's it's the flip side. Uh, if, we, if we do what we can to be international citizens with our own people, take care of our own problems and treat people with humanitarian decency whilst holding them accountable um, will go a long way to making Australia safer. So that's the logic that links the Neil Prakash case. The, the evidence is, is strong, but has to be tested in court that he really was a terrorist with Islamic State and women with complex backstories and, and tragic circumstances. Yeah. Um, we've recently seen the security threat downgraded from um, probable to possible. Has that got anything to do with uh, the the downgrading of Islamic State's uh, power or the fact that they're fighting on so many different fronts in their own own area? 
Look, it's it's the nature of um, alerts and warnings. Um, if you see the same warnings every day in the newspaper about um, you know extreme weather, uh, for a period of time you'll pay attention. After a while, you will switch off. And then if you see that circumstances have changed and the warnings don't seem to have, have responded, um, you know, you quickly stop trusting them. Um, you know, everyone's had a, the uh, experience of driving down a, say, a, a freeway uh, at normal speed. And then suddenly there's a sign saying workmen ahead at 60 k's. And you look around, you see no workmen. <laughs> you go on for kilometers crawling along and say, well, don't really trust those signs. Um, so for alerts to be effective, they've got to uh, respond to the reality that people can experience. Now, sometimes, of course, authorities know things the public doesn't, um, but the public needs to trust that when there's an alert, uh, that it really means something. Uh, otherwise, you get the boy who cried wolf syndrome, where people stop listening, even when the, the danger may be very real. So, yes, the Islamic State has lost its caliphate. It, it's a diminished force in Syria and Iraq, but not absent. I mean, you know, it, it may come back in Syria given the right circumstances, the Turkish invasion of northern Syria may contribute to that. Uh, it's, a, it's a growing force in Africa, along with Al-Qaeda. But as far as impact on Australia directly, it, it still consumes a lot of attention, paying attention to uh, jihadi Islamist terror threats from Islamic State, Al-Qaeda and other groups. Uh, it's still a problem, but it's a problem that we increasingly can manage well. Uh, good intelligence means that detecting and disrupting would-be plots has become um, much more consistently viable. So we don't see audacious terror plots succeeding generally because they they trip over tripwires with um, with uh, intelligence and surveillance and, and they're generally detected. Uh, but that requires a lot of hard work in the background. So, you know, it's it's not that they've gone away. It's just that we've gotten very good at, at um, constraining them. And then it means because we need the public support in this, that we have to turn around and say, OK, we think we've got this under control fairly well. So we're going to lower the alert level and we'll raise it again when we have concerns. And we want you to pay attention when we do raise it again if we have to. So it's you know a, a complex stance. Um, we also know from the authorities that they're working very hard on, on extremist right wing uh, terrorism. It's often very complex, mixed up with conspiracy theories uh, that got more intense during the, the pandemic times. And, uh, you know, like the image of ducks on a pond, all peaceful, um, beneath the surface there's the, the furious paddling of webbed feet. That's the way it is for um, counterterrorism intelligence and for the work of the agencies. But it does make sense they communicate to the public, OK, we're going to step back the alerts now. We'll let you know when we've got a concern. Mm, great. Now, let's move on to Australia's nuclear submarines. We've, it, we've become very important to America uh, with the acquisition of these nuclear submarines. They're great supporters of it, obviously. But we see China coming out, uh, of course, with some fairly uh, stern rhetoric that we could be ratcheting up. And we've even seen uh, France came out, surprise, surprise, and say that it might be a good idea for Australia to acquire these nuclear submarines. Why is it so important to America? Well, let's, let's put it in a broader context, and this is something that is contestable. I mean, there are different opinions on this, but, um, you know, we've long held the view that we can't do what we need to do for national defence in the worst case scenario all by ourselves. We have to do it in an alliance. So the ANZUS alliance has been very robust and, um, you know, in many ways serves us well. I say in many ways because you could certainly make the argument we've joined America in war at times when we didn't really need to, it was not in their best interest to ours. So the invasion of Iraq is one example. Um, perhaps some of the special forces um, rotational activity in Afghanistan was more about um, maintaining their relationship with America than it was about what made good sense for us. So it's, it's, it makes sense to be a bit sceptical. But nevertheless, in the big picture, if worse comes to worse, and at this stage, the foreseeable immediate worst would be uh, China taking action across the Taiwan Straits to use military force to um, reunify Taiwan, as, as Xi Jinping, as Xi Jinping uh, puts it. Um, uh, if that were to happen, uh, there's a real risk of things cascading. So it, be, it goes from being a limited Chinese military operation to a regional conflict and a confrontation that, that gets out of control. Now, some would say, if we leave it and don't butt in, it'll just be a regional thing and we don't need to be involved. And if we go with the Americans, we risk making it worse. But, you know, that's not sufficient uh, to come up with a, a national um, defence plan. We need to think in the worst case scenario, what will we do? Well, in no foreseeable worst case scenario, are we able to go it alone? 
Um, many would like us to leave, leave it to the Americans and their other partners and, and not be part of it. But I think there's also good reason for believing that's not necessarily realistic. It's interesting in Australian politics that there's bipartisan support for the ANZUS Alliance and that Labor, just as much as, as the Liberal National Coalition, uh, believes it's important to maintain and, and, and strengthen this alliance. Now, I, I fully accept the reasons I just outlined. You can have different points of view. But the AUKUS uh, agreement, which involves the nuclear propelled subs, um, is part of this, you know, it, it's a further development of the ANSYS alliance. It obviously brings in the UK in a very clear way, along with the US. Um, and it, it sensibly makes uh, sense to interpret this with other, other regional bodies like the Quad and the Quad Plus. The Quad, of course, involving India and Japan, along with Australia and the US, plus involving countries like South Korea. I think the consensus is that in the worst case scenario, we're all going to have to work together. And all of us means some of us who at this stage don't want to make an issue of things. So Indonesia or Malaysia, uh, you know, understandably doesn't want to make an issue of things um, when there's the prospect of maintaining good relations with China, which we all want to try and work towards. Singapore has effectively a major US uh, naval base, but it doesn't want to call it that. Uh, the Philippines does have naval bases. It's It's threatened to close the the uh, basing agreement, but uh, under the new government, that seems unlikely. Thailand is a, a alliance partner with the US, but wants to downplay that. So there's a, there's lots of regional complexities, but it's all based on this view that in the worst case scenario, we're going to have to work together. So the nuclear powered subs by themselves for Australia don't make a lot of sense. I mean, yeah, in, in an abstract sense, um, because our threats come further to the north, we need faster subs that can be at sea longer and, and move faster and into position. So nuclear power makes sense. But what doesn't make sense is we wait decades to acquire them. But the US and the UK already have such um, such boats and have other um, uh, hardware military uh, assets that are part of the AUKUS agreement. Uh, the OSMIN talks that have just been going on in Washington uh, have made it clear that the the pace of uh, rotations through Darwin and elsewhere in Australia is going to increase. We may also see Japan and South Korea and other nations involved, uh, India perhaps playing a more direct role. It, it all points to a larger pattern that um, we want to consolidate our, our ability to work together. Now, this might mean that we get a nuclear propelled submarines a little faster than the worst case scenario. But I think the real takeaway is that there will be nuclear powered submarines in Australian waters you know, perhaps having a, a Union Jack or a um, Star Spangled uh, banner on them rather than an Australian flag or very likely jointly crewed as a way of building up expertise and, and proficiency. Uh, in, in some respects, that's the more important takeaway. We, we sort of lose track with the detail on when will we get our subs and why do we, they need to be nuclear powered. It's, it's, it's a bigger picture at work here. And there's bipartisan support for it. Um, I, I think it's good to take a healthy scepticism and, and criticize some aspects but i also think we have to be realistic yeah it, it it's a multifaceted um proposition as you mentioned especially too when we consider solomon islands and some of the incursions into the pacific uh so close by china as well yeah i mean we, realistically china wants to be um when well, it is a great power wants to be a great power a weak or standing to America. It wants to have a blue water navy. It wants to be able to sail around the world as the US Navy sails around the world. And for that, of course, you need friendly ports and the ability to resupply. I think that's a reasonable aspiration. I think it's reasonable that, the, that China would seek to have friendly ports in the South Pacific, maybe even some dual purpose stations that it could use. As far as that goes, that's understandable and is, and is reasonable. Of course, the worry is if we had an, you know, the foreseeable threat uh, at the moment is uh, problems over the Taiwan Straits, um, that if, if that should eventuate over the next decade and that China tried to draw our attention away by carrying out other activities in the South Pacific, then we need to prepare for that scenario. And it's not just about military investments and, and uh, even, not even just about foreign aid. We need to work harder at diplomatic relations with our Pacific neighbours. We need to go out of our way to show that um, when push comes to shove, we're a good friend and there may be problems. China may appear to be offering lots of help without strings attached, but there will be strings attached. And, and yeah, we have our own um, expectations, but we're being more transparent. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, not because we want to stop China becoming a great power to equal America, not because we don't think it should have a blue water Navy, not because we see every 
a sign of Chinese military advancement as being um, something we have to contest, but because we need to be realistic about the worst case scenarios so we can try and make sure they never happen. Um, all of us, including China, benefits from our trading relationship. Um, much better that we can try and keep that going. Uh, I think it's fair to say uh, of, um, of our leaders in Canberra, they wish well for the Chinese people. They just have some concerns about the current uh, increasingly one-man rule regime in Beijing. And because it's so worrying, um, uh, uh, taking extra precautions. Yeah. All right. And speaking of trading partners, uh, the embargo on Russian oil, where they're talking about a $60 uh, price cap, how is that going to play out, do you think, Professor? Well, the, the, there's a number of challenges uh, in enforcing the price cap. There's challenges for Russia, too. It's it's finding uh, markets in, in Asia uh, and, and beyond uh, that are very happy to have Russian oil. Um, and so this price cap is not about saying you can't buy Russian oil. It's just saying let's, as far as we can, work together to reduce the amount of profit that Russia uh, can get out of, out of um, selling each barrel of oil. And I'm not an expert in this field, but some people would say any price above $28, $30 a barrel means there's 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 profit for Russia because its its costs are relatively low. Um, so on that basis, you might say, let's try and drive it down so they get no profit. That's not realistic. Um, we can have some control over natural gas because that goes mainly via pipelines. Uh, and there's reason to believe that the Russians blew up their own Nord Stream pipeline. Another story in itself. Uh, uh, liquefying natural gas and setting it by ship is much more costly and slower. But oil, of course, is much more fungible. So realistically, we can't stop the flow of Russian oil. The Russian economy is only about the size, or previously was about the size of Australia's. It may actually be quite a bit smaller now. It's quite weakened, but it's also built in a very narrow base. Um, it, it, it doesn't have much capacity to manufacture things. It, what it does manufacture depends on imported components, which are subject to sanctions, microchips in particular. Um, it, its big source of revenue is oil, oil and gas. Uh, and of course, the, the backstory here is it's involved in a war that is uh, unprovoked, uh, involves, we think, uh, multiple war crimes. Uh, we see Russia now using force against um, civilian infrastructure and civilians, but particularly trying to break down the electrical grid in Ukraine uh, to force the Ukrainians to have a very cold winter and try and break their will. Now, that, that's a war crime. It's, you know, none of this is legitimate. The invasion of the Crimean Peninsula and Donbass in 2014 was not legitimate, even though the world community let them go. The invasion of um, uh, extra parts of Ukraine uh, attempted in, you know, invasion driving through the capital, Kiev, uh, in in February this year, that that you know this is outrageous behaviour. Um, it would be wrong to say that Vladimir Putin is the equal of Joseph Stalin or some sort of modern day Adolf Hitler. He's not playing at the same level of scale. But in terms of the criminality, in terms of the brutality, in terms of the the sheer nastiness and the war crimes, uh, including uh, sexual assault and mistreatment of prisoners of war, you know, there's there's good reason for putting him in that same frame. So how do you respond to somebody like that? Uh, Vladimir Putin was not present at the G20. Uh, he has become a persona non grata. He's become a, a, a rogue leader of a nation subject to a rogue regime. Um, he can't be excluded from the G20. Um, he was excluded from the G8. This is why we have the G7. Um, but is you know, still um, a, a major international power, and we need to respect Russia and the Russian people. But Putin is a war criminal behaving very badly. So there's good reason for doing these things to try and limit his ability to cause harm in the first instance to the Ukrainian people. But if he could get away with it, it's likely to be, be well beyond Ukraine. Mm. Um, it's the main reason why we've tried to put a price cap to stop rather than uh, an embargo, a complete embargo, to stop oil prices ratcheting up around the world by cutting supply, the supply side down? Yeah, look, there is there is plenty of grounds here for some cynicism about um, calculations. I mean, and, and Putin has played upon this. Putin figured that Europe would succumb, bend to his will, if he cut off gas. Um, and I referred to the undersea explosion, the Nord Stream um, pipeline. That appears on the basis of the evidence we have to be the work of Russia itself. Um, but that was after the fact that, that the Europe had closed Nord Stream and wasn't using it. Uh, and that play to try and... Um, take Europe hostage with gas didn't work. Um, there is the awareness that, uh, you know, American voters have just recently voted in midterm elections are really unhappy with the price of what they call gas, petrol. Uh, 
Uh, we we know when we go to fill up, you know, that the price of diesel and petrol here in Australia is the highest we can remember. It's it's it does put practical pressure on households, and so there's an understandable pressure on leaders to try and you know square the circle and find a compromise that doesn't make things worse for their citizens while still putting meaningful pressure on Russia. So yeah, the sixty dollar a cap can't be completely enforced. It's not a perfect solution, but it's a it's a, it's a compromise attempt to try and limit the um, the uh, liquidity available to to Putin to continue this war. Behind it, too, although it's not explained clearly, is the hope that the Russian people begin to see through what Putin is doing to them and and how he's destroying the Russian economy, and that they begin to turn against him. And that you know, there are signs of that happening. Not no one's hanging their hopes on regime change, uh, but in the longer run. This is probably the beginning of the end of, of Vladimir Putin's reign, and economic pressure is what will really uh, deliver those fatal blows. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give you a tip for most Russians. Don't go and look out the window because there might be a spate of people falling from them. Yeah, you know, stay away from the balcony. Um, yeah. I mean, for years, uh, people as senior as Russian ambassadors have had all sorts of mysterious health ailments and, and, and tragic falls. And uh, there's been a series of assassinations um, of senior Gazprom and other Russian uh, executives suggesting that things have gone pretty grim in Russia at the moment. It's grim. I mean, a million Russians have fled Russia. You know, this takes us back a century to uh, to the end of, of the Tsarist regime when people fled. Uh, we're seeing a great brain drain. That's very tragic for Russia. Uh, Putin is popular, but mainly with older people in villages and small towns. Um, it's the whole th situation is very sad. There's no no joy in this, but we do need to hold the line with with Putin and and help the people of Ukraine because there's so much is at stake. And it's not just about U Ukrainian liberty. There's a much bigger picture at work here. Yeah. All right. Well, Professor Greg Barton, thanks so much for your time. We live in fascinating and worrying times, but we'll look forward to catching up again. Great to speak. Thanks very much.